Hello, everyone. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Welcome to the Asian American Writers Workshop. Uh, I am Daniel Gross. I'm the editor of our mass incarceration and migrant detention project. It's called A World Without Cages. I'm also a reporter. Um, and you are at AAWW. Can I get a show of hands of people who are here for the first time? That's fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. Um, a few quick notes about the space. We have two small restrooms on this floor. They're both on this wall here. There's wine and there's water in the back. This is your last moment. Well, not your last moment. If you want to get some wine or water right now, feel free. Um, the Asian American Writers Workshop is a national literary nonprofit founded in 1991 that works at the intersection of race, migration, and social justice. Uh, there are many ways to learn more about us. You can go to our website, aaww.org. Uh, you can read our online magazines, The Margins and Open City. You can uh, come to our events, and we've got a couple upcoming events you might want to know about. On the 23rd of January, we're launching Invasive Species, which is Marwa Hilal's first con collection, and it's featuring Marwa alongside Bilal Mubarak and Sahar Rahmani. And on the 31st of January, Gina Apostol and uh, Sabina Murray are um, celebrating Gina's new book, Insurrecto. Um, we are, of course, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can sign up for our newsletter. There's a sign-up sheet over there. You can volunteer at our events. And if you're a writer and you have a pitch or you want to do one of our fellowships, go to our website, go to our submittable, and feel free to reach out to us. All right. Also, as you just saw on that wonderful video, uh, you can donate, um, aaww.org slash donate, and there's jars throughout the room where you can also um, leave some money. Okay, now for the main event. We have an incredible group of panelists tonight. Uh, they are Madhu Kaza, Nicole Fleetwood, Aviva Stahl, and Sarah Wang. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, okay. There are enough people in American prisons, jails, and immigration detention centers to populate a country. And like a country, American incarceration has its own language. There's a technocratic, euphemistic, and often violent language that the state uses. Offender, felon, illegal immigrant, detainee, parolee. There's also the language that the incarcerated might use to describe their own position in a system of confinement, captive, prisoner, migrant, refugee, returning citizen. And at this event, we want to consider that these are not just words. They're building blocks of narratives. And they have the power to criminalize. They have the power to stigmatize or to humanize, to resist, and to reclaim. So we're going to start the event off by inviting everybody up to the iconic blue couch. Green. Green couch, green couch, <laughs> thank you. Um, and we're going to hear thoughts on language and justice from each panelist one at a time. Um, there will be a chance for Q&A at the end, so please save those. All right. Sarah Wang has written for BOM, N Plus One, the Los Ange Angeles Review of Books. Joyland, Catapult, Conjunction, Stonecutter Journal, Story Magazine, The Third Rail, uh, Ugly Duckling Press, Tiny Crimes, Very Short Tales of Mystery and Murder, The Shanghai Literary Re Review, Black Clock, and The Last Newspaper at the New Museum, among many other publications. Her website is wangsarah.com. Sarah, thank you for coming. All right, um, thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, and apologies if I, I'm squinting. I couldn't figure out how to print this normally. So it's like tiny. I'll just read um, an excerpt from an essay I wrote a few years ago. It's called April 1996. When I was 16, I spent 30 days in Central Juvenile Hall, a 22-acre juvenile detention facility that houses both female and male inmates in Los Angeles, California. 
It was 1996, the year that would see Bill Clinton's re-election, the introduction of eBay, and the gathering of over 200,000 people at the Stand for Children rally to march for children's welfare. Colored contact lenses were popular, especially among Asians. I was booked early one morning in April with one purple and one green contact in my eyes. That morning, a routine monthly court date as stipulated by the terms of my probation, sitting bleary-eyed on a bench with my mother. What I didn't know all this morning spent in court before I was handcuffed and led to the back hallways unseen by the public was that inside the core of the building were cells, elevators, and detention chambers where shackled prisoners were led by guards. Shielded from the public, prisoners are unseen and unheard. Our invisibility is what allows for the perpetuation of not only violence and abuse, but systematic and legalized action against incarcerated people. Through juvenile courts and the adult criminal justice system, the United States imprisons more of its youth than any other country in the world. Juvenile, as defined by law, is a person below the age of 18. In other words, a child. At Central, there was an eight-year-old boy in detention for setting a house on fire. I had been arrested six months prior to that court date in April for the possession of stolen property and placed on a year's probation. Behind the legalese is a story. Let's go to Tijuana, my friend Colleen suggested, pulling a stolen gas card out of her back pocket. That weekend, we took the keys of her adoptive parents' car and backed out of the gravel driveway. Neither of us had a license. We hadn't yet reached legal, the legal driving age. Cutting through the inland basin, Colleen and I made our way through Southern California's various microclimates, the overcast morning quickly yielding to the smog-filtered sun on the I-5. At a gas station, we filled the tank of the Chevrolet and loaded up on candy, air fresheners, energy drinks, and sunglasses. We never made it to Tijuana. In San Diego, after smoking a six-foot bong, Colleen and I drove back to Los Angeles. We were in tears, paranoid, certain that we would crash or drive off the road. Prisoners are not allowed to have a story. Our lives are expunged with a swift backhand. Criminals are in the legitimizing structure of the carceral system, already guilty. A few girls in jail wore orange jumpsuits, indicating a serious or violent offense. I heard that one girl had been pushing her baby in a swing at the park when the baby fell and died. For girls can also be mothers. Girls outnumber boys in rates of detention and arrest for status offenses, behavior that is only considered illegal when a person is less than 18 years of age, such as truancy, curfew violations, and running away. A study on trauma in the juvenile justice system reveals that unaddressed trauma attributes to the criminalization of girls. If trauma is not resolved, it leads, it leads to high rates of drug and alcohol use, involvement in violent activity, and development of mental health problems. For many adolescent females, there's a strong link between experiences of neglect and abuse, a lack of appropriate treatment, and behaviors that lead to arrest. How does one resolve trauma at the age of 8, 13, 16? A week later, we were arrested when the cops came and Colleen confessed to stealing the gas card. I was named. Naively, I confessed to eating the candy, wearing the sunglasses, and consuming the energy drinks bought with a stolen gas card. On the outs, which is what we called the world on the other side of the jail walls, my preferred uniform consisted of purple and green contact lenses, 20-hole docks, fishnet stockings, slip dress, and silver dog collar encrusted with blue rhinestones. I thought of myself as a Chinese Courtney Love. For violating my probation, for staying out past curfew and skipping class, I was sentenced to 30 days in detention by the judge. The criminalization of this behavior had transmuted my life, where staying out past 6 p.m. and not going to class were considered crimes punishable by imprisonment. With two other girls, I was shackled, a chain connecting our three bodies, six hands cuffed at the waist. This is how we care for our children under the false rubric of rehabilitation. All the girls were housed in a single trailer at Central, a sea of chipped metal bunk beds crowded in a single room, one room for a hundred girls. 
Menstruating females who live together in close proximity sometimes experience a synchronicity in menstrual cycles. 100 girls sleeping together, bleeding together. I was the only Asian girl in the two facilities where I served my sentence. Three days later, I was transferred to Silmar, the communal trailer replaced by, a small, by small concrete cells housing two prisoners. Alicia, my cellmate, had a chunk of hair missing from her head. Her pimp had yanked it out of her head while he was high on crack in Venice. She was 14. Girls who are victims of sex trafficking are frequently arrested on prostitution charges. Instead of being treated as victims, they are criminalized as perpetrators. When law enforcement treats girls as perpetrators, the cost is twofold. Our abusers are shielded from accountability and prosecution, and the trauma underlying the girls' behavior is unaddressed, resulting in a cycle of abuse, self-blame, and imprisonment. Research reveals that girls who are sent into the juvenile justice system have typically experienced overwhelmingly high rates of sexual violence. The paternalistic approach taken in dealing with delinquent girls is to detain them as a way to protect them. Women, and thus girls, because it is the sphere of reproduction over which we still reign, must be colonized. In detention, wearing the same uniforms and cast-off state-issued shoes, we look for ways to define ourselves, to write ourselves into existence. One way in which we did this was through the medications that we took. For a girl on three milligrams of risperidone was distinct from a girl on 50 milligrams of Depakote. Analogous to all the restrictions that were placed on our bodies, one area in which we were allowed freedom was in the prescription drugs that we were allotted. Every girl was encouraged to take birth control pills and antidepressants. Most of us were on a daily medley of varied medications. Contraceptives, hormonal control over the female body's organs, anti-abortion and rape laws. Female bodies are property over which we ourselves do not reign. Contracts with private and government companies serving carceral needs, from the food we ate to the clothes on our bodies, the medications that suffused through our bodies to the locks and fences that kept us inside, those who work to indoctrinate and keep us in the judicial system, clerks, guards, probation officers, judges, to the chain shackle manufacturers, suicide-resistant stainless steel toilets, the foam pads that we slept on and the maxi pads that we used. We all know by now that this is a big business, all of it, every single constituent of the penal system is absolutely necessary for the containment of dangerous bodies. Have I mentioned that the majority of incarcerated young girls are arrested for skipping school, running away, and staying out past curfew? States spend approximately $5.7 billion on the incarceration of children each year. The majority of children's offenses are nonviolent. After using the toilet and brushing our teeth in the morning, we lined up next to the bathroom troughs, each girl waiting for her ration, a plastic spoonful of hair gel plopped into a cupped hand. The industrial-sized green tub of hair gel, orbs trapped inside it like aspic, was delivered piecemeal our communion, our Holy Eucharist. I had never used hair gel on the outs, but like the birth control and antidepressants, it was a luxury that I could not deny. So with my palm full of green gel, I walked back to my cell, sat cross-legged on my thin plastic mattress, and smeared it in my hair from my hairline to the crown of my head where my ponytail gathered. By lunchtime, after paramilitary exercises, including jumping jacks, push-ups, and running through used tires, the hardened hair gel had begun to flake. Around my hairline, sweat reconstituted the dried hair gel and liquefied it, sticky streams running down my flushed red cheeks. Girls who are criminals cannot foster empathy because empathy is reserved for those whom the public can assimilate into an intelligible order, which excludes the violent, the guilty, the indigent, the besmirched, the criminal. Silmar was a pre-boot camp facility, which meant that we had to adhere to paramilitary conduct. This included memorizing the juvenile hall's mantra, a combination of religious and bromidic military platitudes that purported to empower us through strict moral and work-related ethics, and with the help of God, empower us by way of shackles, birth control pills, and God. 
Being detained in paramilitary-style correctional facility meant that we had to square our corners wherever we walked, where, whether it was to the toilet or to the breakfast table. So we marched with our torsos erect, making sharp 90-degree turns when we wanted to change direction. This inevitably resulted in some girls endlessly turning in square corners, unable to figure out how to arrive at a destination that was a slant from where they stood. Imagine a world where diagonal movement and curvature do not exist. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Aviva Stahl is a freelance journalist who covers prisons and national security issues with a particular focus on how transphobia and Islamophobia shape the criminal justice system. She's been published by a broad range of outlets, including The Guardian, Harper's, Rolling Stone, The Village Voice, The Intercept, and many others. Her most recent long-form investigation, published this past summer, was into conditions at the Metropolitan Correctional Center, the federal jail in downtown Manhattan. You can follow her on Twitter at Stolidarity, S-T-A-H-L-I-D-A-R-I-T-Y. You should do that. Thank you so much for the story you read. <laughs> Hi, um, so I'm a reporter, yeah, and I write mostly about what um, trans people experience in prison um, and what terrorism suspects in prison. So this is a kind of big shift from what uh, we just heard. But this morning when I was running, I was trying to think about what I wanted to share as a reporter and as someone who most of my reporting is based on correspondence with people on the inside. Um, so I sort of arranged my thoughts around three ideas, uh, which I'll refer to now. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the way that language is used to discipline people inside. The second is the way that Oh, the language of incarcerated people is seen as a threat and so like prevented from coming outside. Um, and the third thing is the f way, basically how the language of incarceration is a, di a discursive battle in which like the state has power over all of us. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go through these ideas really briefly and hopefully it will all make sense. Um, so the first thing, um, the language of incarceration is a means to discipline people. Um, like I mentioned, I read a lot about Am I speaking too quickly for anyone, by the way? No. Okay. <laughs> you said you about trans people? Yeah, okay, trans people. I didn't hear the beginning part. So I just wanted yeah. To yeah, no worries. I know I'm sitting next to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so I write a lot about trans people in prison. And I think that like language is used to discipline people, like bureaucratic language, I mean, is used to discipline everyone in prison. But I would say trans people most of all. So I'll tell a few stories to explain. So one woman I wrote about, um, this woman named Daisy Meadows, she was locked up in Nevada. Um, and she had sort of fashioned a bra out of her t-shirt and she'd put uh, socks in it. And when the prison guard found her, he wrote her up for it and told her it was for possession of contraband. And she got 60 days in the box for it. And when I wrote to the prison officials, like to the media people to ask them to comment, the person responded, first, it's important to recognize that we do not house women in the Block Correctional Center. It is strictly a male facility. So you can get the idea. Mm -hmm. But um, like for trans people, the violence of prisons is tied really closely to, to language, right? Because there are male, female, there are male prisons and female prisons. And like there are only men in male prisons and there are only female and like, you know, only women in female prisons and all the rules about everything, about how you can cut your hair, about what clothes you can wear, about whether you can have makeup, about like every aspect of how you can like comport yourself. Um, and of course, the, those small, like the language of incarceration, oh, sorry. Um, this language of bureaucracy also fuels the huge amount of violence that trans people experience on the inside, right? So it's all tied up together. Um, and the kind of way we force people to comport to either male or, or female prisons really fuels the violence that trans people experience on the inside. And so I guess what I want to point out here is just that like language isn't a matter of semantics. And I, like what I'm saying here is true for the language of incarceration, the kind of violence it does to people is true for everyone on the inside, just maybe most true for trans people. Um, the second thing I want to talk about really briefly is the way that language of incarcerated people is seen as a threat. 
So i uh, just curious, before my story from the summer was mentioned, how many people knew that there was a federal jail in downtown Manhattan? Okay, cool. That's like a lot of impressed. And how many people know that there are people there who are like prohibited for years from speaking to like basically anyone, yeah, anyone in the public, like any, like people who are prohibited from speaking to reporters for like three years? Yeah, a few people. <laughs> so I'll tell a story about another uh, prisoner who I've written to in the past, um, this guy named Ali Yassin Ahmed. So he was um, detained at MCC on terrorism charges a couple of years ago, and he was put on these restrictions called special administrative measures, which basically are put on prisoners at the complete discretion of the attorney general. And it means that people are only allowed to speak to their immediate family members of their attorneys. So they can't speak to like their uncles or their aunts or their cousins, but they also can't speak to anyone in the public or any reporters. And not only that, everyone who they're speaking to, so their immediate family members and their attorneys are also subject to the SAMs, which means that they could be criminally prosecuted and have been criminally prosecuted for like repeating as anything as like trivial as like what someone had for breakfast to like the abuses that they're experiencing every day. And I think for me, SAMs are sort of a metaphor for how prisons operate generally, for how prison administrations will do everything they can to prevent the language of people on the inside and the stories of people on the inside to getting to the outside. So that can mean like letters getting lost <laughs> or somehow people being put in the box when they're communicating with a reporter, but it's also in ways that are, I guess, for me, even scarier, right? It's about like what words prisoners are willing to say on the phone, or what they're willing to write in a letter, right? What they're even willing to, to say out loud, because they're afraid of being retaliated against. And so I think when we think about the world we live in on the outside, it's really important to remember that like language, uh, prisons really restrict whatever what language we can communicate across prison walls. Um, so my third point was I think how oh, this is like a discursive, what was the phrase that came before? Yeah, it's a discursive battle, by which I mean that like it's not just a matter of public policy when we think about prison reform, right? It's how our very ideas about how prisons are, are operating. And so for trans people, like for sure prison administration does not define them completely, but how they can live their lives is really defined in large terms by language and by, by the language that prisons define them by. And for us on the outside, how we understand what we read in the paper and how we even understand the cities we live in are also really defined by the language of incarceration. And so I guess, just to close, I think what I think a lot about as a reporter is what it means to be like a, a critical news reader and when we read stories to think about like whose voices are in here, what facts are in here, what facts, like what kind of facts are a reporter seeking out or not seeking out, like are a lot of times like Prison, prisoners aren't seen as reliable sources, but like prison administ administrations are. And so when we read the news to really think about all the ways that language is shaping the way we think about the world and the way we think about like what's happening in the inside. Thank you. Thank you, Aviva. Nicole R. Fleetwood is a writer, curator, and professor of American studies at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Her books are Marking Time, Art in the Era of Mass Incarceration, that one's forthcoming, On Racial Icons, Blackness, and the Public Imagination, and Troubling Vision, Performance, Visuality, and Blackness. She's co-editor of Prison Nation from Aperture Magazine, a special issue focusing on photography's role in documenting mass incarceration uh, Fleetwood has curated or co-curated exhibitions on art and mass incarceration at the Andrew Friedman Home, Aperture, Cleveland Public Library, Zimmerle Museum, and the Urban Justice Center. And her work has been supported by fellowships from the New York Public Library's Coleman Center, the American Council for Learned Societies, Whiting Foundation, Schomburg Center, New Jersey Council for the Humanities, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And we have a few slides as well for this. Thanks, Rob. Good evening. Um, I, when we agreed to convene on a green sofa, I was very excited, but I'm realizing practically it's not going to work with, with my um, images, so I'm going to have to stand up. But it, you know what? I actually would rather just be kind of at this level. Um, so I'm going to just move forward um, and start with how I enter the work I've been doing for the past seven years. I've been... Um, curating, writing, researching um, on broadly on um, the visual culture of mass incarceration. 
And um, I started um, by not knowing what I was doing. I had just gotten tenure at Rutgers, and I just wanted to like um, do something that seemed like it really spoke from like kind of an interior part of my life. And so I just, when people ask me to come um, present, I would just start showing them these images of my um, visiting my relatives in prison. And I wasn't sure where the presentations would go. And often I would cry, or people in the audience would cry. And, um, and I, I had no idea that it would turn into like a seven-year project that has led me to lots of collaboration, um, lots of curating and researching. And I think for me, the most impactful has been um, being in conversation with currently and formerly incarcerated artists. And I've, so the book uh, that I just finished um, will be coming out with Harvard, hopefully, within the next year or so. But it's largely based on um, about 70 interviews I've done with currently and formerly incarcerated people um, in various um, conditions of incarceration. In there's a chapter that's dedicated to people in, about art made in solitary confinement, people in sound. And, one person spent 22 years in solitary confinement, had very few resources, but continued to make hundreds and hundreds of collages during that time. Um, but it really started with me thinking about my own family and the way that um, carcerality has disrupted my most intimate relationships. Um, and you know, about a couple of months ago, I was at um, an event at Haverford College that was on the legacy of lynching. And I, and I just said, it just occurred to me like so much of my project really is about actually the history of um, especially uh, people of African descent, but other um, racialized groups here on this continent um, being, the, that, that existence has been one of being separated from our loved ones. Um, it forcibly, violently separated, having our most intimate relations disrupted. Um, and that was the heart of the work I was doing when I started just showing these images and talking about it. Um, and something happened very early on. I was at, when I did a presentation at an um, art center where someone came up to me afterwards and said, wow, I never think about people in prison as having people who love them. And, th and, I was, and it shocked me. And this person didn't mean that in any kind of harmful way, but it really it dawned on me that that is how actually dominant culture, dominant society represents the over two million people who are in prison, in prisons that we can, um, we can, un we can um, talk about as prisons, but there are many millions of people who are in forms of captivity um, in all kinds of hidden facilities, in forms of relations to the carceral state through you know, one, one person that I, I'm writing about was a juvenile lifer, was sentenced to life without parole as, at 16 or 17. That sentence is now is unconstitutional, um, but many states are fighting that. For this person to be released, uh, he agreed to a lifetime of parole. So he's going to be monitored the rest of his life, right? So he's still very much tethered to the carceral state. Um, but I say all this to say that often when we talk about um, people who have some relationship, some for, you know, forced relationship to the carceral state, because there are people who voluntarily have these relationships to the carceral state through working as corrections officers and all kinds of ways that people benefit from other people's captivity. But those who are forcibly um, in relationship to the carceral state, um, the way that we, not we maybe in this room, but that you know, dominant society uh, presents them as people who are not loved or grieved or missed, uh, you know, or who are not a part of vibrant family lives and communities and, and the like. And so for me, uh, lar largely pursuing this work has been through the visual, but thinking about the visual um, as a really dominant um, narrative device in our contemporary life. Um, I, um, so I'm showing you images and, you know, we, we only ha each have like um, five to ten minutes to talk and I think I've already talked for that amount of time. But um, Aperture Magazine, and I'm very thankful, invited me to collaborate with them. They were planning a special issue 
on um, thinking about photography and mass incarceration. Um, and it was a really fruitful collaboration. And so much of what came out for us in terms of thinking about the artists and the people who were writing um, was thinking about how people talk about incarcerated people and talk about incarceration. And we actually open with this really wonderful interview between um, art historian Sarah Lewis and Brian Stevenson, where Brian Stevenson talks about narrative and the, and the importance of changing narrative. And, and part of um, his you know, push to change the narrative is also to think about proximity, one way that we continue to allow so many millions of people to suffer um, is because we think of, a, we cre have created some kind of distance between ourselves and people who are in prison, between ourselves and where prisons are located. And we're like in a city where there are like carceral facilities everywhere, you know, and it's for us to actually, um, to f allow ourselves to become much more uncomfortable with the fact that many of the people um, you know, who are, you know, technically our neighbors <laughs> are people who are held in captivity. And I can say a lot more about this during the Q&A, but I do want to just go through some of these images. Um, one of, another issue that came up for us in the special issue was the relationship between, you know, mass incarceration and, um, and slavery and how many, especially in the South and also in, you know, in, um, you know, some other areas that, um, Prisons are often, you know, ba built on literally slave plantations. Um, and so one of the photographers um, that we feature is Bruce Jackson, who's in, who spent some time um, documenting the relationship between slavery and these segregated uh, penal farms in places like Texas and Arkansas. Um, the most well known being, um, I'm moving forward to um, a, a series of portraits by um, Deborah Lester that were done in Angola. Angola is the largest maximum security prison in the world. There's over 6,000 people there. The majority of people sentenced there will die. It is it's, it's a death sentence to, to be sentenced there, basically. Um, over 70% of the people are black. Um, and she did this series of portraits. She's done some ongoing collaborations with, um, and most of the people who, are in, who appear in her um, photographs are people who will who will die in Angola. Angola also has a, a vibrant um, kind of funeral service facility where they have, you know they have cemeteries, they have people uh, incarcerated people building the coffins and, and the like. You know, it's um, so I wanted to show you some of those photographs, um, and then to tie into um, Sarah's really beautiful um, personal essay, we also have this series by Zora Murph who's um, a young uh, photographer who, while he was, um, I think, kind of building his uh, uh, career as a photographer, he was also working for the Department of Corrections in the state of Iowa, where he was a tracker. And so he's tracking incarcerated youth or youth who are um, on so somehow connected to the carceral system. Um, and many people don't know this, but incarcerated young people are supposed to remain anonymous. So here you see this tension between um, Zora Murph, one, tracking them as part of his work, and also trying to like create this a sense of kind of individuality while also you know, um, respecting this policy of anonymity. Um, and then you know, thinking about issues of proximity, I wanted to just end with this photograph. We end with this series um, in the special issue by Stephen Torlentis, who um, teaches at Mass Art and has done like this really amazing series of um, basically carceral landscapes where he's gone around the country photographing prisons and prisons impact on the environment um, and he doesn't use any artificial light he just uses the light that's emanating from the facility and thinking about the, you know the invisible labor thinking about those held in captive captivity but also connecting it to a longer history and that of manifest destiny and the the, the, the violence of the, the colonial project that we that we're still living um, the the kind of aftermath of so thank you thank you so much Nicole you might notice that um, there's many types of language that we're talking about here visual language literary language and then the language of nonfiction and of facts um, Madukaza 
Madhu Kaza, sorry, was born in Andhra Pradesh, India, and is a writer, translator, artist, and educator based in New York City. She is the editor of Kitchen Table Translation, an anthology that connects translation to migration, and which features immigrant and POC translators. As an educator, she has taught workshops and seminars for faculty and students in non-traditional environments, both in the US and abroad. She works for the Bard Prison Initiative as the director of the Bard Micro College at Brooklyn Public Library. Now it's on? Yeah, okay. Um, so I guess I want to speak, um, first of all, I guess I want to say that I'm not um, uh, an expert on incarceration. Um, and I actually, even though I work for the Bard Prison Initiative, um, I actually, uh, it's, the work is not, that, that I do is not criminal justice reform related work. Um, and so I don't, I, th I think that where I speak from is from like this middle distance, which is um, neither, you know, having a, I have not been incarcerated, nor am I someone who's really directly, um, I don't have any direct advice about terms to adopt to change policy or to, you know, steer the discourse. Um, I have preferences and I have th words that I avoid and words that um, we certainly use. Um, but I think the, w the space that I speak from is, um, I think this middle distance and as a teacher and a writer um, who has, and, and as a citizen, I think, as someone who's thinking about how, um, is deeply interested in language, um, thinking about how language shapes us, how we use language, and how we might use language. Um, and so I actually wanna begin um, kind of far afield um, which uh, is um, in Burma, or Myanmar, or Burma, and um, mentioned that the first um, Facebook spat I ever had um, was, when I, was when I was in Myanmar. Um, and I um, spent three and a half years, I spent a lot of time over the span of three and a half years um, in uh, Myanmar working on educational reform. And at that time, um, there's a lot that I learned about language there and um, in relationship to um, persecution and incarceration, um, specifically um, language that you cannot use in uh, authoritarian contexts. Um, and specifically, I was thinking about the word Rohingya, um, the, the people, who, the Muslim population of Rakhine State who are um, you know, victims of a genocide. And um, at that time, in 2015, I had this Facebook spat because um, Rohingya is a word that you cannot even, it, it's officially, the official line in Myanmar is that the Rohingya don't exist. Um, so there's that official you know, truth, and then there's actually a social truth, which is you cannot say that word um, in, in public or with friends even. Um, and so it's a really tricky thing um, to you know, talk about a people who don't exist. Um, but I remember in 2015, um, there was a moment of Western press coverage and um, someone had posted on Facebook, someone who I did not know, um, about the migrant crisis in Southeast Asia. And I remember just being like, you know, um, I think they're refugees and not migrants. Um, and so we started getting into it, you know, as people do on Facebook. Um, it was my first experience of it. But, you know, really, I was just really thinking about the language. And specifically, you know, and I was using words like concentration camps, which there are in Rakhine State, internment camps, genocide. And there was a lot of pushback, you know, about that language. And what, exa and, and uh, you know, to be really clear, I was not, I did not visit any of these camps. I did not speak to people who were, um, you know, imprisoned. Um, but it was a really interesting moment also to think about how language also depends on who's right, who's in power, who's wrong, right? And something about the listening in the West, I think, also had to do in that moment around um, what does it mean to talk about the, um, the victimization um, and dispossession of a Muslim population being persecuted by Buddhists, um, which is not, you know, a discourse, you know, that's, we're not really so receptive to that over here, um, generally, right, in the age of um, talking about radical Islam and terrorism and all of that. And so, um, so it, it was just kind of a moment when I really started thinking about language um, in, in, in this way. And um, I did speak uh, in Yangon to Rohingya activists and what struck me was that uh, there was one person I spoke to who very actively spoke about genocide. Um, but there were a number of people I spoke to 
who were fervent you know, um, advocates for their community, but who would not use those terms. Um, and I thought it was, it, was really, it was a really good lesson in thinking about myself as an American. And also, I was not there as a reporter either. And I would constantly you know, think about the fact that they, they might not be using these terms not because it doesn't represent a reality for them or that they don't think that that's accurate, but it's about the context. It's about my relation to them. Like, who am I you know, to them? What kind of trust do we have? What do they think is going to happen with that language? And so on. And so it just is something, you know, I, I was really made aware of the luxury of being careless as an American with language. Um, and so, with, you know, returning back home, thinking about um, the home context, um, I think it's something that I keep thinking about in terms of the way that we all actually do speak multiple languages in different contexts, you know, the code switching that we do, um, how we speak, the language we use in official contexts versus, you know, at home or with different um, in groups. And, um, and I also think about it, you know, and so, and so it's something I keep in mind even in my work um, with the Bard Prison Initiative. Um, I taught for a number of years in different um, prisons. And again, I'm thinking about language because I, I teach humanities courses, literature courses, and writing. Um, writing is a very big component of, what, of the work that I've done in prisons, um, teaching writing. And, um, but what's interesting about working for BPI is that we're a, we're a college. Um, we are you know, part of Bard College, although we operate um, somewhat independently. And um, so the terms that we use to talk about the people that we work who are incarcerated are student and um, scholar and tutor and alumna. And um, when students come into the classroom, um, I mean, first of all, being in um, prisons, I find, are actually incredibly disorienting um, for language on so many levels, um, including, you know, often by the time you get into a classroom, I, like, I, that there's this feeling of, like, literally not knowing where you are, so how to name this, like, how to describe the space becomes really challenging because you're so turned around. Um, but, um, but once we're in the classroom, you know, what, you know, what we'll say to students is, you know, here, your students. Um, and this is a college, and we're in a class, and we're not looking at you as inmates or prisoners or, you know, and so on. Um, and I think it's a really important distinction because it allows space within that prison context for, stu uh, for our students to see themselves differently. Um, to, there's a little bit of, a, you know, a bit of <laughs> freedom that's created in that space, um, that we're not interested in their record, in, you know, like, I mean, things do, you know, it's not like, the boundaries are not absolute at all. Um, it's very clear that we operate as a college in conjunction with a prison, with prisons. And, um, you know, also that we are inside prison. So for instance, you know, the work that we ask students to do as college students, um, they're writing essay papers and sometimes short stories and different kinds of, they're doing a lot of writing, right? Um, and there's a space for them to explore ideas and really think of themselves differently and at the same time, we are also deeply aware that that language is still subject to scrutiny and surveillance in a very arbitrary way, right? Um, and people get in trouble, get sent to the box for things that they've written, right? So it's a complicated thing. It's not an absolute, like, it's not like, you know, the college comes in and saves people from, you know, their prison context, right? Um, and, you know, but there is some separation there. Like, we talk about the politics of the yard and the politics of the classroom and having some separation. And I think that that's a you know, really important thing for us. Um, and I think the fact that it's an, it's an affirming thing, I think, for them to think of themselves as students, right? um, as scholars. And um, now in the context that I work, um, which is mostly on the outside, um, at the, at, um, the Bard Micro College at Brooklyn Public Library, um, we employ, our staff includes a number of BPI alums. So again, the term is, they're alums. And they also work as writing fellows for us. And this is part of their reentry. So these are formerly incarcerated people. Um, and they're also mentors and tutors, um, colleagues. And some of my BPI alum colleagues are also community leaders, community organizers. So you know, there's, this other, there's this whole other you know, set of terms that, you know, that we mostly function with. Um, and at the same time, you know, I think, so I think this language is really important. Um, it's, I think it's central to, to what we do. And at the same time, like um, a completely different context, um, something I'm loosely affiliated with is um, the New Sanctuary Coalition, the immigrant rights group um, that does um, 
uh, clinics and court accompaniment for um, immigrants who are doing ICE check-ins and some of whom are detained and facing deportation. Um, and this organization, it's, you know, it's a group of citizens who really uh, go to court just really just to bear witness. The idea is that you're showing up for people who are facing, you know, who are you know, dealing with the court system just to show the court system that people are watching. Um, and so it's not, there's no intervention there. You're not doing anything super active except you know, really bearing witness. But w I just wanted to point to this because in that organization, I think it's really interesting that we refer to the people that we are accompanying as friends. And um, I find it really fascinating, that language, um, because so we would say, oh, tomorrow I'm going to go to 26 Federal Plaza to um, you know, accompany a friend to, you know, on their court date. Now, these are friends who you don't know. You know I, don't, I wouldn't know their personal history, their, why they're in detention, or why they're facing deportation. It's not that personal, intimate idea of friendship you know, that we, we think of, but I think that that term, it, I don't know, it has a lot of charge for me, and I think it's really interesting to think about. Um, and I think the last thing I want to say um, is that with all of this, I think, again, going back to the idea of context, um, I don't, again, I, don't, I feel like language, like particular terms are really important in terms of like policy and politics. But I also think that like language is so contextual and it's a living thing. And I think this is going back to, I think some of the things that came up here like um, earlier, which is like, I think all of the, everyone was in some ways talking about what does it mean to give space for real stories, right? Like, for art, for art, for like real correspondence, for you know being able to tell one's own story. This idea that you know prisoners are not allowed to tell their own stories, and I think that whether it's their own stories or other forms of art and narrative, um, where like really there's an there's an attempt to kind of grasp for the language to that you know kind of gets at the reality. And I think that there is. I mean, I think that we can't say like oh we found the term, you know, incarceration is better than you know um, felt you know. Uh, imprisonment or something like that. Um, there are terms that are better than others, right? But I also think there's there's something about, um, I think the thing that I would advocate for is really like kind of a alertness to language, the ways in which we're constantly in, the way that it shifts, that people themselves speak in different ways. Um, you know, again, even the people that I work with who are formerly incarcerated will use different terms in different, in, in different moments. There are those moments when we get silly and there's a certain kind of language that comes up and there's a moment when they're going to talk to their parole officers and it's going to be a different you know, kind of language. So sometimes you want the words that, ex that really express the brutality of what's happening. Sometimes you want the diplomatic word, right? Um, sometimes you need, and, and, and people, and sometimes, and you know, we talk about the euphemism of bureaucratic state language. But um, people who are incarcerated also use euphemism. And sometimes that's a form of protection um, from censorship and, or to give um, authority the slip, right? Um, but also because not every moment is it bearable to name exactly what is going on. And so I think that there's this way in which like, we operate in these many different streams of, of language. And I would say the thing that I'm interested in is less you know, um, is really just being alert to all those shifting contexts and, um, and recognizing, you know, that it's like, again, that language is a, a living thing that we do together, you know, um, and that um, part of what art, you know, narrative, what art can do is really grasp for the, like, there, there is no way, to, I mean, the horrors of these experiences, I think, um, you know, some, again, sometimes you need to speak systemically about mass incarceration. But mass incarceration is a term that also doesn't get at that granular feeling of what it's like to be inside, you know, that you need like the narrative for, right? So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Madhu. So we're, we're gonna do a few questions up here and then I know that there will be many people who wanna jump in. So we're, we're definitely gonna have a moment for questions at the end. I wanted to start by picking up on a couple threads. Um, Madhu, you, you talked about relate, uh, language being relational uh, and contextual. Um, and Nicole, you talked about these historical links to slavery and to violence. It seems to me that language in incarceration is often used to hide this history and this relationship to violence. It's used to obscure and often to emphasize individual actions. Um, the word offender, which is a pretty common bureaucratic term, uh, focuses on what a person has done instead of 
um, what the system comes from. And then there's another um, kind of, but then there are these moments, I, I suppose, when uh, you do see what is actually going on. And, and an example is a, is a letter I remember receiving early in, in reporting on prisons. And it said um, that all of my property in prison says property of DOC on it, property of Department of Corrections. And, and he, this person wrote to me talking about a T-shirt that said property of DOC. And when you wear it, it suggests that you, the person inside the T-shirt, are the property of the Department of Corrections. Um, and so there are moments when uh, ownership and, and the relational nature of language maybe suggests what might be going on underneath the surface. So I'm interested in your takes on what language, what words can reveal the history of slavery and the relationship to violence and maybe push back on this, um, this obscuring that's going on. Maybe to make that very concrete, what words do we need more of? What words do we need less of? Can you hear me? One book I recommend is Kelly um, Lytle Hernandez's book, City of Inmates. She's a historian at UCLA and wrote this really amazing book where she looks at these four historical case studies and she puts in conversation um, gender nonconforming people, um, formerly in, um, enslaved people, um, and um, indigenous First Nations people. Um, also, she, I think she does work around um, poverty and class, um, to look at how mass incarceration, she says, the punchline is mass incarceration is actually mass elimination. You know, and I think that um, one of the things that often happens is that we um, either get caught up in the mass and we think about numbers and we think just this kind of, um, or we get totally zoomed in on narrative um, especially any kind of narrative that is about transformational or quote re redemptive, um, but um, you know these kind of narratives that in fact really um, continue the perpetu perpetuation of the state of the carceral state, um, and you know I think there's very little work that we do across various um, differences to think about um, all the stakeholders, you know. Um, and I mean, for me, that's one of the things that I'm interested in. But I'm also interested in um, how incarcerated people um, are forging alliances um, and doing um, a lot of this work. And I don't want to romanticize that space. But I think that often we don't, um, that incarcerated people, so many of them, their voices do get out. So I'll, I, I want us to, like, um, when we say people are invisible or unheard, to be careful that we're not reproducing that invisibility or th that we're not listening. Um, and what I just want to, and I think even as researchers and very sympathetic and people who are directly impacted, it can happen. And for me, one is, you know, I was interviewing someone who had spent time in solitary confinement and had experienced all of these forms of no touch torture. And he was speaking often in euphemism, he was speaking. Um, but at one point, he was telling me about being in a room and experience a form of sensory disorientation. He was forced to stay in this room that was covered in blood. Um, and he had told me this several times. And it was not until I was transcribing his interview that I realized he was sharing something incredibly traumatic for me. And I was, you know, and I, you know, and I realized that I wasn't there present for him when he was actually sharing that. Um, and then another is that a lot of incarcerated people I've interviewed who are artists really talk about how that space of making art is a space of really breaking down a lot of the social alienation, of the way that incarceration eviscerates relationships, the way that it reproduces um, racial apartheid. You know, many incarcerated people work across these differences. So I do think that, like, um, people who are really invested in shifting these kind of narratives and shifting what the Carlson State does to us broadly, um, you know, it's there's all kinds of ways of being involved, but I think a lot of being involved is actually listening, uh, finding really ethical and thoughtful ways of um, being in relation to those who are held in captivity. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Uh, 
I'll just add one thing, which is um, a very particular thing, which is um, I'm thinking about um, the people that I work with who are formerly incarcerated. And again, I think this is why like, there's no one, I feel like it can't fix one term, because one thing that's come up, um, and so I, I work, there's right now um, a number of men, they're all men right now, um, who work um, at our program in Brooklyn um, as writing fellows and tutors. Um, and we have, um, every few weeks, we have a kind of professional development um, meeting. And you know things come up um, in, in terms of their own professional development, in terms of the work that they're doing, that reminds me that they are formerly incarcerated, but that it's like the discipline of that incarceration is still with them, right? And so it's an interesting term because the idea like a thing happened to me, I was, you know, I was incarcerated and it was formerly. Um, and I, so I don't, there's no term, I don't have a term for that. But you know, the, the ways in which like it, there's this lasting impact. And it has to do with like, for instance, one day we were talking about like sometimes our writing fellows have to um, um, discipline students and they, some of them cannot do it. And they cannot do it because they're, they're like, you know, where we come from, um, we are always wrong. And so you see any sign of conflict and you just walk the other way. And so this, this and I'm like, okay, this is interesting because it's part of our, you're out now, right? You're, you're in the world and we're, we're training you for other kinds of things. Um, but this idea that we're formerly incarcerated and we kind of put that behind us. So, you know, like there's that, the desire for that triumphant narrative. There's this thing that happened to me. I was on the inside, I'm out. And that's true, you know? And there's more to it. So I don't, like, I don't have a term for that, but I think it just speaks to the ways in which like, it, it always has to be multiple and like, layered. I think it's maybe not an accident that um, in your essay, Sarah, the language, described, uh, the language that describes behaviors of young people are replicated or, or sort of are, are transferred into criminal behaviors that apply in prison and outside of prison. And so the word discipline is used in a school setting and it's used in a carceral setting. And that's, I don't think our society necessarily distinguishes because there's an underlying um, type of social control at play in both of those settings. I can jump to another question if no one else wants to hop in. Yeah, I mean, it's strange because when I was young and spent my month in juvie, um, I was really kind of oblivious to what was going on. It was all a blur. Um, and I have to say that um, when you, when I was arrested, um, it was such a brief thing. It almost was like it didn't even happen. They fingerprinted me, took some photos, and then I was sent home with my mother. Um, it wasn't until later when I was on probation and I violated my terms of probation, which I talked about in the essay. Um, and I don't even really, I, I wasn't even aware of exactly um, the concretion of the terms, you know, um, truancy, um, things like this, which kids are late to school all the time. Um, kids ditch school all the time. Um, and that these things can be turned, I mean, it's almost like, you know, living in a hellish nightmare where all of your normal behaviors are suddenly turned into criminal acts and turned against you for which you can be um, imprisoned for. And so it was, it was unreal, really. Um, and it wasn't until kind of doing the research for this essay that I revisited, um, that month in juvenile hall and realized the kind of insanity um, and criminality kind of placed on ordinary behaviors um, and that this is it and it's it's um and you know as i said in the essay um girls are more frequently um imprisoned and arrested for these kinds of violations of probation terms versus boys, and so there's also a gender discrimination there. Um, but I guess from my own experience, it is just kind of terrifying how normal things can be all of a sudden used against you, documented, 
um, legalized, of, officialized, um, and kind of like read back to you in a court of law. And um, yeah, it's still, it's still terrifying to me, and it doesn't really make much sense. Um, yeah, that I think kind of jumping off that, um, when you report on prisons, there's, there are like rules, like you have to say what someone's convicted of. So even if it, you think the crime is ridiculous, like nobody should ever be incarcerated for that, or even if you think the crime someone committed was horrible but has nothing to do with the substance of what you're discussing, you still have to put it down. So I think a lot of, for a lot of prison reporters, it's navigating the space between how do I talk about this person's crime in a way that doesn't make the rest of my story like get dismissed. Mm -hmm. And also how do I tell a complex story about this person that talks about the way the violence they're experiencing but also gives them agency but doesn't romanticize or like paint them as some kind of perfect story, right? And it's this kind of dance you have to do to um, tell like a, a real story but sometimes it feels it's really impossible because so much of what you're talking about is like in the imaginations of the reader and what they think about criminals or like sex offenders or terrorists and yeah. in journalism to use the word inmate, which I don't use, um, but having had some battles with journals who either want to interview me or, and I, or to quote me and will often rephrase and use language that, that I find very violent. So like, I think that also is a challenge in terms of having conversations across these various fields and disciplines. Uh, oh, one thing that I just crossed my mind is um, also in the piece, um, this one cellmate that I had, um, Alicia, you know, um, I'm sure in her arrest documents it says that she is a prostitute, but what she really was was a victim of sex trafficking, you know? Um, and it's just for these girls to be criminalized for being sex trafficked and brainwashed and manipulated. I've been watching the R. Kelly documentary. I don't know if anybody, anybody else has, but it is just, it's terrifying. You guys should watch it. It's like a six part series on Lifetime and it's all about how um, he has basically been a pedophile and um, running this like sex cult where he's imprisoned um, like half a dozen women and brainwashed them. Um, and some of these more former victims testify. In any case, um, it's just, you know, there's all different kinds of language we can use. Um, and um, yeah, it is important to think about things in different ways. Brown, um, we're just saying the recent clemency of Centoya Brown as an example of much, some, of the, some of the issues that you're talking about right now. Who, who retaliated for violence against her and, mm -hmm. and then was in prison for that, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I wanna ask one more question and then open it up. Um, and this picks up on, on the, the word inmate that, that editors so often like to, to jump to. I think this has something to do with the hunger for redemption narratives. Um, there's a kind of a, a cheap irony that editors often rely on, which is like these inmates are doing this amazing like music composition inside a prison mm -hmm. and the irony or the or the like satisfying turn of the story that the editor is hoping to play on is that these people who um, you know did something terrible or um, you know their life went the wrong way are now doing something good mm -hmm. and I, I suppose why why is there this obsession with redemption narratives and is there a way to tell a story more complicated kind of resist that um, tendency. You were smiling over there, Madhu. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's definitely um, some appetite for certain kinds of feel-good stories. Um, I know I can definitely relate to that because the work that um, I've done, both with uh, Bard Prison Initiative and also um, before that, I did some work um, in jails uh, through another, through my own nonprofit. Um, and, um, you know, like, we do poetry in the prisons and, you know, like the Shakespeare in the prisons and whatever, whatever it would be, um, this idea that there is this 
also problematic thing of like what it means to humanize uh, or, you know someone who's incarcerated, right? This idea that we're going to take this person who you think is like so terrible and um, and you know show you that they're not, or or also just it's gonna, but that's like what is it doing to you as a reader, for instance, or an audience, like appeasing your sense of like well maybe things are okay, you know, like prison might not be great, but like they have art. You know, like there's some weird thing, you know, in terms of that, that we, I think we have to also be aware of. Like, how do we hold all of it together? And um, and I guess I'll tell one story um, really briefly. Um, one time, more than a decade ago, I did something that, um, so unlike the reporters, like, you know, as an educator, I don't know what, why people are there. I don't know what their, you know, felony conviction is. And I'm not interested, we're not interested. Like, again, those are, there's a real boundary there. And, uh, but one time, uh, many, many years ago, um, there was a student who I just, I loved. And she was like a mom, and she, every, you know, every day she would say, you know, get home safe, and I'd say, get home safe, you know, across the hall, or whatever. And um, she just took care of everyone. And I just, one day, um, being not so smart, I, I went home and I said, I, w I wonder what she could have done. You know, and it's easy to find out, and I found out, and it was, um, you know, it was, it was, um, she was res like convicted, um, essentially um, for being responsible for someone's death, um, and it was like a horrible crime, and um, and I just remember the next day coming into class and thinking like, how do I? Um, like I didn't want to, I, I could feel, I felt differently knowing that, and also that the crime had happened at a children's birthday party. And um, you know, like I had lots of conflicting feelings about it. And then, but I also knew that like the context in which I knew her, um, this was someone who like deeply wanted to like write and like learn. And, and it was an interesting moment um, for me. It was, a, it was a good moment because I didn't do that again. Um, People sometimes tell you, you know, what they're what they're in for, but I didn't do that particular thing again. But I also I remember had, having to deal with the fact that I have to hold all of it, you know, um, that this is the conviction. I don't, I, which doesn't mean I know what happened with the case, right? But that's the conviction. And then um, here's this person who, in in the context that I know her, is super dedicated, super warm and caring, and. All of it, you know, it's all there. And so I, I'm just saying that in terms of like, you know, sometimes we want to transplant one thing with another and, you know, the stories are complicated. Yeah, I think about this a lot. Um, I think sometimes when you find out what someone's crime is, and I, I have I've definitely had that reaction, but you're finding maybe someone's like deepest, darkest secret or like some terrible moment in their life, and you feel this real, you're holding power over someone in a way they could never be able to hold power over you because Nobody can't, someone can't just like look up your number <laughs> and find out some horrible thing you did that you wish you'd never done or maybe didn't, but anyway. Um, I think for me what I've thought about is the way that it really reinforces these narratives we're taught about prisoners or people on the inside, right? That like they did something terrible and then they're locked up and that's where they should be because they're bad people and then they're going to be in prison and they're going to get better and they're gonna be rehabilitated. Even if that's not what it, what's explicitly said in the story, I think that's really at the heart of it and that it's supposed to make us feel like a sense of like emotional resolution about the fact that they're there and we're out here and that there's like justice in it and actually we're sort of doing them a favor because things are yeah, on the brighter side or something. Yeah, I think there's something tempting often about bureaucratic language because it makes the word world more orderly and everybody wants to make sense of what is in front of them, even if it doesn't truly make sense. Um, let's open it up. Um, what are your thoughts? What are your questions on language and justice? Got a question in the back. One sec, there's a microphone heading your way. Good evening, my name is William Ori. Uh, I don't like to say I was formerly incarcerated. I was in prison for 12 years. I've been home for seven months from Attica. And I, before I went to prison, I, I thought I was a loving, caring person. But there were certain things that happened to me over the course of 12 years that changed my attitude and personality. Uh, I worked the law library for 10 years. Um, and uh, I believe that the, there's a social stigma that goes with incarceration, and it starts when you get out. And a prime example is what you said when you talked about the woman, you wanted to find out what her crime was, and you said murder. 
while I worked the law library, most of the men that were committed of murder, they only had one felony. It was murder. It's not a trajectory crime. It's not a crime that they repeat and do. But yet, they're also, I think you used the word eviscerated or the woman in the middle, beautiful word, I, I lost it. But they are treated the worst, and they're probably, it's, it's usually a crime of passion or something happened, they couldn't control themselves. They didn't get up and say, I'm going to be the ax murderer. I'm going to be the next serial killer. But they're treated so harsh, they're, they're, they're hit by the parole board so much because society has the same thing like, oh, it's a, and I, I'm not putting you down, I'm just speaking my thoughts. It's a horrible crime. Yes, it is a horrible crime. But the, something happened. I don't know the mindset. I don't know the sociology of that woman. Maybe she was abused. Maybe her husband was beating her up. I, I just don't know. But they're treated so unfairly. I do so many Article 78s for men convicted of murder that it's just unfair to them. And I believe that us as a society, we're part to blame. Um, in, in closing, there was a president named Dwight D. Eisenhower. He talked about the military industrial complex. The way he outlined it is the same thing that happens with mass incarceration. It doesn't start all of a sudden you go to jail, you're mass incarcerated. It starts, uh, I couldn't remember the author, he talked about the conspiracy to destroy the black child. It starts in first grade, second grade. It's like, it's being cultivated, it's becoming part of the American fabric, mass incarceration. Thank you. Thank you, William. And a thought on the word murder. Murder is applied, the word murder is applied in many states, not to the person who committed the action of killing someone, but the person who was present and maybe helped uh, or didn't intervene. In Texas, under the law of parties, if you are present simply in the same room and you didn't stop your friend from killing someone, you can be convicted of murder and, and you'll receive the same stigma when you go to the parole board or on death row that someone who, could, who actually committed the act would receive. Reactions to that, or should we go to the next question? I, I really appreciated your comment. Um, and I speak as someone who's had relatives convicted um, and sentenced for murder. Um, and the uh, permanent stain on people with that conviction, and also the complexity of all kinds of cases that we 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 you know we also we don't really care about the complexity of of um the situations that often I, i'm never justifying the killing of someone um but there's so little care about the routine and systematic violence that most people who end up in prison live in <laughs> from the day they're born until they end up in the prisons, you know, in, in a prison, um, that it, yeah, it's a much, it's, I think it's infinitely much more complex, um, and also quite simple in terms of the fact that it is, I do see, I hold Hernandez's statement very to heart that mass incarceration is mass elimination. It's that find, uh, you know, rendering, you know, whole groups of people as socially, politically, economically devalued. Um, and finding ways of actually profiting from the devaluing of, of certain populations of people. Um, and it's interesting that you, what you said about, uh, quote, violent crimes like murder, that, um, you know, m most kind of, the, I mean, crimes that are often um, repeat crimes are crimes of property, you know, and these are also crimes of poverty, right? That, so um, w that we, th you know, we choose to be very ignorant around um, why people are in prison, how prisons work, and you know, and I think we're all accountable for the for the ignorance that we perpetuate that allows so many people to to suffer. We're all accountable. We're responsible. Let's take another question. Hi, um, my name's Ayo. I wanted to ask you guys um, if you had any opinions on um, the idea of like the spectacle of crime, because I was thinking you've mentioned, someone mentioned R. Kelly's documentary, and just thinking about like how Serial is a super popular podcast, and there's entire networks dedicated to sort of like salacious shows on true crime. So I wonder if you could talk about that in terms of like how it plays into this like system of violence, as well as how um, it sort of plays into the American mindset. Um, surrounding um, the carceral system. I, mean, I, think, I, think it's, I don't want to be on one, but I just think it's like an excellent 
I think it's an excellent question. But, and I also think the spectacle of prison culture, that like the, you know, it would, we often rarely hear about the absolute day in, day out boredom of people who are locked in prisons. And most people experience extreme boredom and sensory deprivation and alienation. And, you know, it, but again, it helps to perpetuate um, prisons if we, you know, create the spectacle around it. Yeah, I'm just going to say how difficult it is to actually get funding to tell complex stories about prisons that actually give like social context and political context and yeah more thinking about who isn't whose stories aren't getting told and like what journalists aren't getting paid <laughs> I think it's a real problem um, particularly so I, I often work in podcasting it's a it's a serious problem in audio narratives that people are fascinated by crime and want to hear a true crime story or a murder mystery and I think it's a common kind of misunderstanding of, of Serial, for example, that the first season was a murder mystery, and that by the end of the, end of the um, season, you would figure out the identity of the killer, and that somehow you would then be able to move on from this story. Um, and I think if any of you listen to Serial season three, I think that's a season that does a much better job of basically just lingering in the system and following people around and trying to listen to their voices and see um, the messiness of it all, as opposed to the kind of simplicity and the spectacle of watching the, you know, detective find the killer. I'll also add that um, in terms of spectacle, I think, you know, one of the things that also happens is that I think um, from the perspective of, you know, working in prisons, um, there's also this allure, right, um, of people who want to work in prisons. Um, I mean, not as COs um, per se, but um, but you know who want to volunteer, right, or teach or whatever, and um, and um, and it can be for many reasons, right? And it can include that there is this really um, you know that like I don't know whatever fascination people have about the spectacle of prison, um, and it can one thing that's really interesting, especially as someone who um, I, in, in, in my role right now, I don't hire people who teach in prison, but I hire faculty and I think about the kinds of people who want to work with particular kinds of students and in particular spaces um, is, um, you know, there's a lot, there are a lot of people who, um, you know, have like a lot of fascination around that. And I think one thing that always strikes me is that it's such a, um, as, a as I'll say as a professor, like you'll never have more power than you will in a prison classroom, and it's a really messy thing. Um, I mean, the, what happens in the classroom is, is, is great, but in part it's great because those people are so disciplined, you know, like they cannot act out, you know, and it's, it's, it's really complicated. And I think um, also working within those spaces, um, even just as someone who just, you know, you just go in and out, um, it's so, it is, it's, it's bureaucratic and boring to get in. I mean, not, I mean, boring can be good because sometimes it's n not boring and it's like, you know, they don't, someone doesn't like what you're wearing and you're not going to get in that day. Um, and there's this constant, like, tug of war around, like, really small, like, it's so painful sometimes, just the kind of negotiations you have to do. And, you're, and you're th I'm thinking, if I'm going through this, like, the hardest part for me, you know, and for, uh, you know, for those of us who, you know, work in, with prisons is, like, dealing with the whole, like, the actual, you know, the power system of the prison, right? Um, and with, with the correctional officers and so on. Um, but I'm thinking if this is like tedious and hard and difficult for me, you know, going in a couple times a week, just can't, you know, like the, uh, can you just imagine, you know, what that might be like have to, to never be released from that, you know? One more question. Many questions. Hi, thanks. Um, so I was just kind of wondering how do you guys recommend society starts changing the la the language surrounding incarceration? And I mean, what can journalists do to help that change? What can educators do to help that change? What can we sitting in this room do to help that change? I guess I'll sort of um, 
speak a bit more about what I said before, which is I think that journalists need to be held accountable for the language they use and the stories they tell and how they choose to tell them. And also readers and subscribers need to like voice their opinion about it. Like I can't stress enough how many battles I have with editors about language and it's this constant tension of like, do I want to be published in a bigger outlet or do I want to like have an editor who agrees with me on like every question about language? And um, I think like there needs to be a lot of political shifts in newsrooms and that's also about who's hired in newsrooms. Like, I don't know, there's like maybe one, maybe the Marshall Project is the only newsroom that has formerly incarcerated reporter. You think that's true? Maybe the appeal. Yeah, but basically nowhere. And so I think we really need to think about like, well, how do we get people in prisons on staff? Or how do we really solicit inside reporting? And um, like, yeah, what are the responsibilities of you guys as readers in that process? I do think that I, I totally agree about the um, claiming our own responsibility for participating in the narratives that we are recognizing as harmful. And, and I, I know that I have done it in my own work. I've maybe taken advantage of the redemption narrative when convenient, or I have chosen not to have that argument with my editor about the word inmate. And I think, um, Nicole, you, you said very beautifully that we are all a part of this system. Right, and I, I mean, it's like, and not that, you or any of us will make, you know, but it is small. I think there's a lot of local things that we commit to doing. From, you know, yesterday I was down in downtown for, I was in a jury pool. And I, my, uh, I was initially resistant, but I said, if I get called, it's probably the best thing because I, I ended up ending a friendship with someone, a, a white affluent woman who was on a jury in very liberal Manhattan. and convicted someone to murder based on one person's testimony. There was no other evidence, but it was like the week or two before Christmas. And the people who came in his defense, she said they all spoke ghetto talk. And so, and this is in liberal Manhattan, and she considers herself a very liberal person. So there's all kinds of ways that we can get involved, you know, and like when we, you know, who we vote for, you know, I mean, who we elect to be, you know, like in, in all these little ways. I mean, it, it's, it's such a, the carceral system is huge and it's so complex, but it, it really does matter um, how we think about um, people in positions that really have life or death power over other people. There were a lot of hands, so I just want to give one more question if, if uh, there are any. Hi, my name is Paul, and um, I just got released from maximum security prison three months ago. I was sentenced to 16 years. But the catch is that I was wrongfully convicted. So after four years, they actually found evidence, um, and they finally released me. So I've been out three, uh, three months now. Uh, I believe the gentleman was from Attica. I went to Attica. I, went, I was in Comstock, and then I got released out of Sing Sing. Uh, maximum security prison, and so now I'm just right, trying to rebuild my life. So, um, can we just I've give both of the both of these men a round of applause, please? <laughs> Before all that happened, I actually had a six-figure job in banking. I have a bachelor's in finance, and I actually have an MBA as well. So right now, I'm actually rebuilding my life. I'm working as a waiter <laughs> right now in the process. But I really loved her question as far as some of the things that we can do. I wrote over 40 letters to journalists while I was inside, including the New York Times and various other places, and I had to do it under the guise of other ways to try to get it out. Um, so what, what are some of those forums, if you're asking for inmates, prisoners, convicts, whatever you want to call them, what are some of those forums and ways in which people can get the word out, people that are inside and know, people that can give you those firsthand accounts what are some of those forms or ways that they can do that? Because there's no ways. We, we did that when I was on the inside by word of mouth, and somebody randomly had typed papers or had written addresses where they think they knew a guy, and they had to hide it because there were cell searches. So what are some of the ways in which you, you find that inmates, uh, prisoners, et cetera, can get the word out to you about what's really going on in there, including a lot of the abuse uh, that's going on there, and that's a whole other topic in of itself. Thank you.
I mean, I think many of us are aware of the prison strike that happened in the fall, right? That so I think we like, and and it was led by incarcerated people in, uh, you know, with uh, with allies outside of prison. So I think part of it is for us to, you know, to resist the false narrative of an inside outside device. Yeah, uh, uh, divide. Yes, there are people who are held in captivity. And we are tethered to those systems, meaning we're voting, we're breathing the same air, and, and we find ways of being in allyship. I um, mean, there, there are lots of different um, organizations run by formerly incarcerated people that are run by people who are in prison, who have allies outside. And one organization I can think of that was like Black and Pink, and that's for LGBTQ incarcerated people, like through pen pals. I mean, it literally is like fighting one of the most dominant ways that incarceration impacts society broadly, and that's by removing certain people from public conversation. So when this is back to like the New York Times and magazines and newspapers that use inmate, like so much of it is because it's, to me, whenever I read that, I think, oh, they have, a very clear idea who their public is, and their public is not people that they see as socially devalued, you know? And so you can only write that kind of language if you're not speaking, if you're not writing for the people who are most directly impacted. And so when we have, um, we're in positions where we can be very clear about who, you know, like when I write, I write hoping, I, my number one audience is the people I'm writing about. And so it's to use language that speaks, I want them to be able to see themselves very clearly in what I'm saying in ways that they feel like they're being respected and honored. And so, I mean, there's all kinds of forms, I think, where um, we don't have to be just a journalist for that. Like who we, how we talk to people on the street, you know, how we, um, you know, there's all, you know, many of the people we're interacting with on the streets are people who are like, have been really impacted by the carceral system. And, are carrying around all kinds of suffering and wounds, and I think that when we change that kind of narrative, that that um, in our own ways that we carry ourselves, I, I think there is a, 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 I think other shifts start to happen. Any closing thoughts? I was just going to echo what you said about like pen pals and finding ways to reach across prison walls and to build relationships, even when it's. Yeah, exactly. Even when it's hard and like letters get lost and it feels exhausting, that like it's really important for there to be a dialogue and like friendship and um, yeah, like I think also sending letters is such an important way to like show prison officials like someone on the outside cares about this person. It's you can't mess with them like the way you might be able to otherwise. It's actually huge. Many of the people I've written about, some of them have gotten out, and it's be it's partly because people are writing. And I write letters for parole boards and things of that sort. It, it is actually saying this person you treat as a devalued subject is someone who's highly valued. And, you know, and, and for me, that's a political practice that I, I, whenever someone asks me to write for them, I write on behalf of them. Yeah, I think my last thought is just that I think that like, um, I was really inter interested when I was writing the story about MCC that so many people didn't know it existed. And there's another federal jail in, in Brooklyn and near Sunset Park. And I think that, you know, there's, um, like the carceral state does so much to make prisons invisible. I think you also said that. Um, and I think that like having pen pal relationships is a reminder of like that's a reality. And people are living in that world and it's a separate world from ours, but it's still a shared universe. And I think anything we can do to bring those realities into our present is really important. Well said. I've seen recently in the past like year or two maybe a lot of, um, not a lot, but some publishing opportunities for formerly incarcerated people, grants, um, publishing opportunities, and um, I mean, you guys might know better these resources, but we, I we have- We run one as well. It's a World Without Cages accepts writing by incarcerated people. So if you, if you know some, if you're formerly incarcerated, write for us. Yeah, and like right now, um, there is, I have seen more of these opportunities than I have in the past. So, um, yeah, to like find these resources and to write your own stories, I think um, right now is a good time to do that. Uh, let's have one more round of applause for our four panelists. Thank you so much. <laughs> Madhu Kaza, 
Sarah Wang, Nicole Fleetwood, Aviva Stahl. Thank you.